Good morning. All right, we are going to pick up right where we left off. Um, we had been looking at examples of calculating pressures in fluids, and we had just done a pretty challenging example, I guess, of looking at air pressure uh, dropping off as we go to higher elevation. I just flipped through a couple of those to see um, where we were. Um, it's a useful example to go through, uh, but uh, some of that stuff was a little bit beyond what we're looking at the course, and I, I, I feel like we identified those. Anyway, let's, let's move on here. Um, at the ocean level, atmospheric pressure is uh, about, you know, 101,300 newtons per square meter. This is called one atmosphere. Uh, we, we went over all of that, so I'm, I'm going to move here pretty quickly. Uh, there's this uh, unit called a bar. So there's, there's way too many pressure units out there. A bar is 100,000 newtons per square meter. Uh, you'll hear this on the weather reports. So, uh, or if you go to a, a weather forecast or something, it might give the, the pressure in bars <clears throat> instead of in atmospheres. Now notice, a bar is almost the same thing as an atmosphere, not quite the same. We have, we have too many units. Uh, standard atmospheric pressure is just above one bar. Now this is always funny the way this gets stated. Uh, this pressure does not crush us as our cells maintain an internal pressure that balances it. Um, Pressure, it just is what it is, right? So it just happens that on Earth we've got this pressure. Uh, I mean, think of, of um, organisms living in the ocean. Uh, everything is just under, you know, there's this background pressure going on all the time, and it's essential. It's not that we somehow are able to survive this pressure. It's essential to, to the, all of our physiology. So all of our physiology is based on the idea of uh, you know, different compounds uh, dissolved into water, and if you remove the atmospheric pressure, water isn't a liquid anymore. You know, the issues on Mars, uh, if you've been following the Mars story with all the rovers and whatever, uh, is that we're guessing on Mars, uh, the atmosphere was much thicker uh, billions of years ago, and at those higher pressures, water could exist as a liquid, but at the current pressures on Mars in the atmosphere, uh, the liquid state of water doesn't, it's not possible. It requires there. So it, it's essential. The pressure that we have going on uh, is essential to our physiology, uh, the way that our bodies work. It's, it's just something that everything is, it's kind of like everything is squeezed together, and then you're going, okay, here's the pressure you're going to work from, so let's see what happens at this pressure. We, do, we don't want to remove that, uh, because that's how everything has developed um, all of life has developed with that uh, pressure. Um, and we talked about this too. We talked about uh, gauge pressure versus um, absolute pressure. So that's the formula. And then we just want to look at a couple of examples here. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think there might be one homework problem with this. Uh, because when we get a fluid like this, here is a, uh, here is a lift for a car. Now, the car is heavy. The car has a lot of mass. How could I possibly uh, lift a car to this high elevation uh, without an enormous force? And it turns out what we can do is we can get a compressor. So if we can just get a compressor and create a lot of pressure in the fluid, then use a large area over here. Well, the force on the car is pressure times area. So if we can get a pretty good pressure uh, set up, you know, several hundred kilopascals here, uh, then we can just go to a big area, and that big area will create a larger force for us. So with uh, a relatively small force on one side, we can get a lot of force on the other side. And it always seems like, well, wait a minute, isn't there kind of like a physics law that, um, <clears throat> you know, forces have to match up? And it turns out it's not. You know, we saw this with uh, torques also. By adjusting lever distances, we could change torques. You know, it's, it, so, so, so anyway, um, this is another example like that where we can get a lot of force out by uh, boosting the pressure of a fluid and then using a large area. Same thing with a braking system uh, that they're showing. In, so you're pushing on the uh, brake pedal, and the brake pedal is connected to a 
but here they have a master cylinder. Uh, so the brake pedal is creating an increase in pressure in something where there's a small uh, area. And then with the brake pads, the areas are much larger. And so uh, the fluid uh, maintains that pressure, and the brake pads can push against the, uh, the disc, the brake disc, uh, with uh, a larger force. Uh, measurements of pressure, so <clears throat> here is here's an example of how we could measure pressure. So here's a glass tube of some sort, or a metal tube, doesn't have to be glass. Uh, here is atmospheric pressure here, and then we connect this to another source. Now, this is connected to something where we want to measure the pressure. So we've got some sample, we're going to take this tube, we're going to attach that onto the sample, and find out what the pressure is inside. If we find out that this pressure from inside is able to push the fluid so that this side comes up, this side goes down, we can take that difference in elevation and use our pressure formula to figure out what the pressures are. So we can, you know, we can use tubes, uh, vertical tubes, and uh, keep track of pressure differences that way. Um, here's just a couple of gauges. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, slides were here. I thought we could take a look at them. So here, you know, here's my bicycle pressure gauge, and uh, here is the end of it. And I'm pushing that, putting it into contact with the air that's inside the tire. And then just a mechanical system with a spring, right? And so more pressure pushes more forcefully. The spring compresses, and the gauge sh shoots out a little bit. And so we can tell what the pressure is. <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, we have way too many units for pressure. So let's get rid of some of these. Uh, let's see, which ones should we get rid of? I do like atmospheres. Atmospheres are handy because, hey, atmospheric pressure is, is what's going on all the time for us, or most of the time for us. We're all, always at kind of one atmosphere pressure. Uh, <clears throat> certainly the newtons per square meter, we have to keep that. Now. We've got newtons per square meter, we've got pascals, we've got joules per cubic meter, which I mentioned in the previous lecture. I kind of like that. The bar, I don't know how I feel about the bar. I mean, I feel like we don't need the bar and the atmosphere. You know, lose one of those. Uh, maybe we define this as an atmosphere. I don't know. Anyway, these seem a little redundant. Uh, the dynes per square centimeter is just using smaller units. So, um, if, if you're working in a centimeter system instead of meters, uh, the force units are dynes, so I guess we keep those. Um, pounds per square inch, I guess we can get rid of that, right? We can get rid of the uh, English system. Uh, pounds per square foot, like, again, we can get rid of the English system uh, units here. Is that really what? Shouldn't it be larger by 140? Oh, the, I see. Uh, One pound per square foot. Uh, I'm a little nervous about some of these numbers here. It seems like a pound per square foot should be much larger. Um, not sure why a pound per square inch is, is 6,900. Uh, pound per square. Hmm. Okay, I got, I got to double check that one. Uh, this is, these are the ones that I have real issues with. I think it's time to lose the uh, millimeters of mercury and the centimeters of mercury and the pounds per square inch in the past. So we can get rid of all those. Uh, a tor is just a millimeter of mercury, so that's redundant also. And then millimeters of water, we don't need that either. So I would say ignore, ignore. Well, you guys have to know some of these. Ignore, 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 ignore. Maybe keep... Maybe just keep the atmospheres, right? So we would keep the atmospheres, uh, the pascals, and that would be it. Uh, it's always a little funny when you go to the doctor and they give you uh, your blood pressure in millimeters of mercury, and I go, really? Doesn't that sound a little archaic? Can't we switch this over into pascals or kilopascals? Wouldn't that be a more sensible unit to work in terms of? I think so. So millimeters of mercury, I think, are kind of an embarrassment. But um, anyway... Uh, here is a mercury barometer, so here is where those millimeters of mercury units come from, is because hundreds of years ago, uh, researchers found out that you could take a, a bucket of mercury, and uh, you could take a tube, fill it with mercury, invert it, 
So by inverting it, there's a vacuum there. There's no air inside here. And what happens is the mercury falls a little bit, but then the outside atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury here is able to support that column of mercury. And when they measured it, it was 760 millimeters of, of mercury that one atmosphere of air could uh, support. And so that's where it came from. Now, mercury is really dense. And so, uh, you know, 76 centimeters is like this. And so it was possible to have a barometer right there in the lab room using mercury. And you could walk over and see what today's atmospheric pressure was uh, by reading that uh, barometer that had been uh, calibrated. Now, what would happen? Is this the? Yeah, this is the. Uh, this is the mercury and water. So let's imagine making a barometer. Now remember, the way the barometer works is we take the tube, we fill it with the fluid, and then we flip that over into a container with more of the fluid so that there's a continuous path here. This now is a vacuum, and so there's no air pressure inside. So with no air pressure inside, what we can do is we can calculate from top to bottom how much pressure that would be. So at the top it's zero and then the pressure increases. And uh, we can calculate that by using our delta P equals rho GH formula. We just solve for H. So how much of a height of a fluid would I need to make a barometer? And um, if the atmospheric pressure is 101,300 newtons, uh, uh, newtons per meter squared, and the gravitational field is 9.80 newtons per kilogram. And water, let's try using water. Water sounds so much safer than using a mercury barometer. Uh, so for water, the density would be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And putting all the numbers in, I got 10.3 meters. Uh, it doesn't seem very practical. So if you have a lab using a water barometer, uh, it requires 10 meters of water to uh, set up one atmosphere of pressure. And that's kind of remarkable, too. How much air does it take to accumulate one atmosphere of pressure? And it takes like, you know, 100 kilometers. If you go right to the edge of outer space and you drop down through the atmosphere, by the time you get to the surface, you have built up, you've accumulated, you've integrated, 101,300 newtons per square meter. Now, given most of the air is near the surface, so at first you're not integrating very rapidly. Um, but in any case, it takes the entire atmosphere to accumulate one atmosphere of pressure. It only takes 10.3 meters of water to uh, accumulate one atmosphere of pressure, okay, because it's so much denser, consistently denser. Now, that's not very practical, but let's do mercury. Uh, instead, mercury is a fluid. It's got a, a specific gravity. Its density is 13.5 times larger than water. So if instead of using water, we put in the density for mercury, it turns out, now I got this using the best numbers I could find. I did not get 760 millimeters. I got 764. So I don't know if that was a problem. Um, but again, I used the, um, the best uh, mercury density numbers that I could come up with. So I, I don't know if this is the correct number and 76, 760 is a bit of an approximation. Not sure. In any case, that made it practical so that the barometer would fit inside the room. Otherwise, this is what it looks like. If you use a water barometer like um, Torricelli used, it looks like, or Pascal, uh, here is a water barometer, so in their lab, Look, they've got those supports sticking out the windows. I think that's an awesome picture. And, and somebody has to go up to the fourth floor to read the barometer. You know, you send one of the students up there, right? Hey, could you run up there to the fourth floor and take a look at the barometer, see what today's air pressure is? Uh, I guess they could have dug a, a tunnel or a hole um, to make that more accessible. Anyway, it's a good thing they had a, a fourth story uh, floor that they could go up to to read the barometer. All right, what about suction? So, uh, you know, someone suggests using suction cup shoes for space shuttle astronauts. 
Suction depends on pressure differences. And so uh, suction works because there's an outside atmospheric pressure pushing and holding that object against the other object. Uh, what you do is you push on those suction cups and uh, reduce the air pressure inside, and then the outside pressure holds the suction cups in place. So in space, good chance that's not going to work. Other things, you know, that aren't going to work, like vacuum cleaners. Um, you know, if you go up to the moon, the moon's really dusty. It could use a good vacuuming. But um, with no air, uh, there's no pressure differences set up, and so you're not going to be able to uh, push. There's no air to push the dust into the vacuum. Remember, there's no such thing as sucking force. Uh, if you're vacuuming something, it's the air pressure that's pushing the dust into the, um, into the vacuum. Okay, so, all right. Uh, we looked at all this pressure stuff. All of that's really important. Make sure you can do these pressure calculations. Take a look at the homework problems on pressure. We're moving on to what I'm gonna say is the next really, really, really important part of the chapter. And that is uh, buoyant force. So we actually started at the very beginning uh, of chapter 13. And, and had that nice picture of, of buoyant effects going on. Uh, so here's an object. It's, it's floating. It's not, it's not necessarily floating. Let me take that back. Here's an object. It's submerged in a fluid. Uh, it's, it's not clear whether it's, it's floating on its own or not. Now what's going to happen is there's a force from above and there's a force from below acting on the object. Who is bigger, the force from above or below? And the fluid force, the force of the fluid, is larger below because the pressure is larger below. So since the pressure is larger here, F2 is bigger than F1, and that difference is referred to as buoyant force. So there is a force due to the presence of fluid pressure. If we combine all of the fluid pressure effects surrounding the object, the ones on the sides can be canceled. We saw that if we look at equal elevations, those effects are all going to cancel. It comes out down to how much bigger is the force below compared with the force above. Now those forces can be written in terms of pressure times area. Now here is the area factor, and here is the pressure. It's the density of the fluid times g times the difference in depth. So here they've used h1 and H2, and then delta H is the difference. Now, I... And, and then they did a little bit, bit of algebra. So I'm going to say these lower two, uh, I highlighted these. I, these are the ones that we're going to use in, in our force diagrams. So whenever we have an object in a fluid, there is going to be a buoyant force, and the amount of that buoyant force depends on the density of the fluid. If the fluid is more dense, we're going to get a larger buoyant effect. Uh, times the volume of the fluid that has been removed. So it comes down to how much fluid has been displaced by the object. So that's not necessarily the volume of the object. Now in this case it is. The, this object is completely submerged. So the object's volume is the same as the fluid volume that has been removed the displaced fluid. But that's not always going to be the case, uh, times g. So that will tell us how much buoyant force we have. Now an alternate way to think about this is the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid, I, I should have added a big F here too, they didn't have it, uh, is the mass of the fluid. So the buoyant force can be thought of as uh, if I take the fluid that used to be there, and determine how much mass that fluid had, that mg is how much buoyant force we've got. Okay. All right, so um, here is, and this is referred to as Archimedes' principle. It goes back thousands of years. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the amount of buoyant force that we have is equal to the gravitational force. At, this is the fluid. When that object was not in the container, when fluid was here instead, that fluid was in equilibrium because there was a buoyant effect balancing its gravity. So fluid within fluid just hovers, 
But that's because there is a, you know, the pressure below is going to be higher than the pressure above. So that's a, a really interesting uh, principle. We can think in terms of how much mass here, how much mass there. Now this is a little confusing. We've got two pails of water. So I drew it like this. Uh, okay, here's a bucket, and there's some water inside here. So let's get... Um, Okay, so here's a bucket. Kind of remember the whole story here. So here's a bucket. It's got some water inside. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take another bucket, and we're going to put a piece of wood inside. Now, what we want to do is we want to have the water level here match the water level here. Now, the wood is floating. So uh, the water that has been displaced is not the same volume as the wood. The volume that has been displaced is that much downwards. So if I look at the water level, and then I think of the water that used to be there uh, before we took it out. So when we put this wood in, in order to keep the water level from changing, we scooped out just enough water that the wood goes in, and the wood is now floating. Now part of that's above the water level, but we scooped out just enough water so that the wood, the lower portion of the wood, would fit here. So we scooped out that much uh, equivalent to this. So what would happen if we now took the wood out and replaced it with the water so that the level stayed the same? Then we would have this much water. So this much water that was displaced has the same mass as this wood. And so what they're asking us in the problem is, which one of these buckets is heavier and if we have main, if we scooped out some water and replaced it with the wood in a way where the water level stayed the same, then these two masses match. The equivalent mass of water uh, to the equivalent mass of wood. All right. Um, so here's a statue, it says. And so we're going to start using buoyant force. Um, they call it Archimedes' principle, but more often than not, we're going to come back and just say, hey, there's a buoyant force going on. So here's a statue that was discovered. Oh, look, it's a statue of Archimedes. Uh, and so there's a gravitational force, and it's underwater. Uh, the, there's a gravitational force pulling down on the statue. We're going to lift it out with force F. Does F need to be as large as Mg? Not to lift it through the water, because as long as this statue is, you know, submerged, we're going to get an additional buoyant force, and that buoyant force is going to help us. You, you guys may have noticed this if you're out at a lake or out at the beach or something, when you, uh, or a swimming pool maybe is the easier place. If you're in a swimming pool or something, uh, you can lift something up, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be as heavy, until you get it out of the water, and then it feels heavier. And that's because the buoyant force, while it was in the water, is much larger than the buoyant force in the air. Now, everything we've done so far in the course, I guess, every object we've looked at, there was a buoyant force acting on it due to the presence of air. How were we able to ignore that? And it turns out that we've ignored the buoyancy of air um, because all the objects we've looked at, the, buoyancy, the densities have been typically thousands of times greater than the density of air, and so the buoyant effect is a small effect. Okay. Uh, let's see how we, um, we do this. They've given us a volume, they've given us a mass. So here is this statue, and we're starting to, there's tension in this, in this cable, uh, and there's a buoyant force. Now I'm writing the buoyant force as density of the fluid, volume of the fluid being displaced. So I'm putting that subscript of F there so I don't confuse myself. That's the fluid we're talking about, times G. Uh, so I've got to make rho VG match up with mg, uh, not with mg by itself, but the ten sorry, the tension and the buoyancy together are going to offset mg, and we're going to lift this at a nice steady uh, pace out of the water, uh, lift it to the surface. And once we get to the surface, then the tension is going to have to get greater if we want to lift it out of the uh, water. Now the mg on the statue, they told us it's a 70 kilogram statue. I don't know how they did that, but somehow they knew. They said the volume of the statue is 30,000 cubic centimeters. I converted that to cubic meters in case I end up using that. 
Uh, it tells me that the density of the, st of the statue is 2,333 kilograms per cube. I was just curious. So the statue's made out of, I don't know, that could be plaster. You know, plaster could have that density. I'm surprised that it hasn't dissolved because uh, it is down in ocean water. Uh, I looked up the density of ocean water. Now, ocean water is denser because of all the salt. So there's all these, you know, compounds in the water, and that makes the ocean water denser. That gives it a little extra buoyancy. So this is the Mg, and now that I know the density of the uh, ocean water, and I know how much fluid will be displaced, the fluid being displaced will be that 0 0.0300. Put that in, and it's, this is on Earth, so there's its gravitational field. It says that the buoyancy, uh, buoyant force, is going to provide 301 newtons. Well, mg of the statue was only 686. So look, buoyancy is providing almost half of what we need to lift the statue. So the tension we need is uh, the 686 minus the buoyancy 385. So as long as it's in the water, as long as it's submerged in the water, we're going to have that additional 300 newtons of buoyant force, and uh, I only have to pull with 385 uh, so again, every time uh, you do one of these problems, do a force diagram. Do the force diagrams. Practice those. We've already been doing those uh, throughout the course. Practice those. And then just remind yourself, and I, I, mean, I remind myself by drawing the object and showing all the fluid pressures. Remember, the buoyant force is not magic. It's a result of fluid pressure. The fluid pressure from below is larger than the fluid pressure from above. Fluid pressures do not zero out, so the force doesn't zero out. We get a net effect, and that's what we're calling buoyant force. All right, uh, so here's another example with Archimedes. So the king, this is the story, right, is that the king of somewhere in Greece, right? Is this Athens or something? Is it Sparta? Anyway, uh, there is, um, here's a crown. And the crown shows it has a mass of 14.7 kilograms. When we put the crown into water, that reduces to 13.4. Can we tell what it's made out of? Turns out you can. So here is an object. And again, I got all those fluid pressures drawn in. Here is the tension. Uh, here is the buoyant force. Here is mg. Now, m, they told us, uh, is 14.7 kilograms. That means that mg is 144 newtons. I didn't need the zero. So 144 newtons is uh, gravitational force acting on that object, on the crown. Now the tension that we pulled with, I can take that 14, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this was 14.7 before. Uh, now the tension that I'm pulling with when it's in the water is reduced. It's the equivalent of 13.4 kilograms. Now I can take that sort of equivalent mass, multiply by g, and that says that the tension then, that, that we had to pull this to support the crown, we only needed a tension of 131.3. You can see I was nervous that there would be a small difference. So I, I, I kept the extra sig fig here. And so what's happening here is, what I've done is I've measured the buoyant force. Uh, without the buoyancy of the water, uh, I needed a tension of 144. With the buoyancy in place, I only needed 131.3. Um, and that, I did this again, that gave me 12.7 newtons. I'm keeping extra six things. I've got, I've got enough. I don't want too many points taken off for that. So 12.7 uh, newtons. So that's the buoyancy that we're getting. Uh, we were able to measure the buoyant force by measuring it once uh, in water and once in in air, I guess I should have gone in and um, uh, determined how much of a buoyant effect I'm getting from the air. It would probably be like, you know, a thousand times less than the numbers that we're looking at. All right, so once I've determined the buoyant force, then I can use my buoyant force formula, uh, rho F V F G, and solve for, I solved for the volume, uh, Uh, so I know what the mass is. Okay, that looks good. So, um, 
we knew what the mass was, we solved for the tension, we solved for the buoyant force, now we're solving for the volume of that crown, and that is uh, buoyant force divided by rho fg. Uh, that gives us um, the amount of fluid that was displaced, 0 0.0013, um, that was in uh, cubic meters, and then I can get the density. So I get the density, the density is 14.7 kilograms, that's what we measured, and then we determine the volume, and we actually determine the volume here by using the buoyant force. And then by taking mass divided by volume, we said that the, vol the density of this crown is 11,300 kilograms per cubic meter. Now if it were solid gold, which is what the crown maker claimed to the king, uh, then it should have a density of 19,300, so it's not pure gold. Okay, there's probably other stuff mixed in with it. Uh, however, this crown was made. It looks like the crown maker kept some of the gold uh, for themselves. All right, here is, uh, here is an object that floats. Here's a piece of wood, um, and it's floating. Now, what we've got here is that what we're stating here is that if an object's density is less than the density of the surrounding fluid, then what happens is the buoyant force is uh, larger uh, than mg. So in this case, we've got this piece of wood, we pushed it down below the surface, and you guys know what happens if you take something that naturally would be floating and hold it under the water, what happens when you let go? It shoots back. Now, why is that happening? And it's not because it wants to be on the surface. It's because with that lower density object under the water, there is more fluid being displaced, and that leads to a larger buoyant force. So this object, completely submerged, uh, there will be a force of, um, oh, why did they write it this way? They wrote it as mass times g. So it's the force equivalent to a 2,000 kilogram object uh, pushed all the way under. But the mass is only 1,200 kilograms. So if the equivalent, uh, if the buoyant force is the equivalent of 2,000 kilograms of fluid that's been displaced and the object's only 1,200, there's going to be a net force upwards. And the net force upwards will create an acceleration. So the object accelerates to the surface bobs around a little bit, and then settles in to where the amount of fluid, how much mass is there in that fluid, below uh, the lower part of the uh, object, and that's going to be 1,200 kilograms. So it'll settle in wherever um, the displaced fluid mass matches the mass of the object. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So here we got a floating object. And what we can go through and show, I don't know if they've showed this, no, I guess they have shown this, sort of. Uh, here is the buoyant force on my floating object. Here is the gravitational force. Now the gravitational force could be rewritten. Uh, this object has a certain mass m. Its mass could be written as its density of the object times the volume of the object times g. Whereas the buoyant force is written as the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid displaced times g, we can set those equal. So if it's at equilibrium, there's no acceleration taking place, uh, let me go back to this, then I can take the buoyant force expression and set it equal. The g's cancel out. So when the gravitational field cancel out, that tells us this would happen on any planet. So, uh, the, uh, um, if we were on a different planet with a different gravitational field, but we still had enough pressure that, you know, water existed and we could float objects, then uh, we would still see the same portion of the uh, object um, out of the water. Okay, so they set these two equal, and then they set up this ratio where the volume displaced divided by the total volume of the object is equal to the ratio of the densities. Now with this object, I would say this object has half the density of the surrounding fluid. Maybe it's a, a chunk of wood floating in water, but whatever the fluid is and whatever the object is, uh, it looks like half of it is submerged. So if half of it is submerged, displaced over object, 
then uh, the density of the um, fluid is going to be twice that amount. Yeah, so the density of the object is going to be one half uh, the density of the fluid. So if this side is one half, then this side is one half. Uh, if the densities here were three fourths, you know, if the object had a density of three fourths of the fluid, then three fourths of it would be below the water line. All right, here is a hydrometer. Uh, this is based on buoyant force. What you can do is you can take these little hydrometers. Maybe you've seen these. Uh, you can drop these into a fluid and measure what its density is. Now, this is calling it specific gravity. But if you remember, specific gravity of 1 means it's the density of water. So right now they've got water inside there. And they're calibrating this so that it, it comes in right at 1. And then they'll put some other fluids in. They'll put in some isopropyl alcohol or, you know, whatever other fluids and uh, compare the densities. Now, right now, it's set up so it's 25 centimeters long, 2 square centimeters cross-sectional area, and the total object has a mass of 45 grams. So let's find out how to calibrate this. Uh, so when this is floating in the water, or a different fluid, there's going to be a buoyant force acting on it, uh, there's going to be a gravitational force, B is equal to mg. Now, B is e that, that statement's here. B can be rewritten as rho vg. So the fluid density here, this is water, and they gave us a bunch of grams and cubic centimeters. I think I'm going to work in centimeters. It looks like that's what I've done here. So in terms of uh, grams and cubic centimeters, uh, water has a density of one. One gram per cubic centimeter uh, for water. And um, we can put that density in. Now the volume, um, the volume submerged, this is x. So x is telling me how, how much of this object is below the water line, and uh, the volume here is going to be pi r squared, where r is the radius, and pi r squared times x. It's a cylindrical shape. Now, the r that they gave us, did I write it down here? It's on the page before, was one centimeter. So, uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. They gave us the cross-sectional area. I remember. So, uh, this whole cross-sectional area is two square centimeters, uh, the volume is going to be A times X. All right, so that tells us how much fluid is going to be displaced. So now what I can do is I can take the buoyant force, set it equal to mg. Here is the expression for the buoyant force. The g's cancel out. So you'll see on almost all of these buoyant force problems, the gravitational field factor cancels out. It comes down to masses, volumes, and densities. Now. I could uh, say that the, um, uh, the density of the fluid is the mass uh, of the fluid divided by the volume, and the volume is A times X. Now, they told us that the mass of the uh, hydrometer is 45 grams. So that's telling us that if this thing is 45 grams, what's the mass of all that water that's been displaced? The part below that and that would be 45 grams of, um, 45 grams of uh, fluid, of, of water, that's been displaced. So what we can do then is um, we can solve for x. Uh, the density of the, of, the, of the fluid that this is in is equal to that mass divided by the displaced volume. The displaced volume is the cross-sectional area times x. And then I solve that for x. Now, if it's a 45 kilogram hydrometer and the cross-sectional area is 2 square centimeters, so they kind of gave us the numbers we really needed. And then for the, if this is water that we're using to calibrate this, then I just want to put a 1 there. And it says that the x distance then would be uh, 22.5. So the prediction here, or the calculation here, is that it should be floating such that at the 22.5 centimeter mark, that's where the mass of water being displaced matches the mass of the hydrometer. And the hydrometer has been weighted 
at the bottom so that it stays vertical. Um, anyway, that's what we solved for was that's where we want to put the 1.000 mark is at uh, 22.5 centimeters. All right, a helium balloon. So this is one of my favorite examples because it forces us to remember the properties of air. Air's got mass, air has a density to it. Um, let's take a look at this helium balloon. Now, uh, as long as we've got this nice picture here, uh, let's see what we've got. We've got a buoy effect. Now, the buoy effect is primarily coming from the balloon. It says that it's spherical. I don't know how you maintain a spherical shape. I guess you do it with different structure. There must be a rope or something around this so that the balloon fills and keeps a spherical shape. Anyway, it looks like it's spherical. Now, I've got buoyant force up, and I've got a bunch of masses downwards. I've got the mass of the load, that's downwards, and I have the mass of, I guess, the balloon material is included with the load, and I got the mass of the helium. So the helium still has mass. It's still got a gravitational force. That gravitational force is downwards. The helium is pulled downwards by the gravitational force. Um, so that's something you have to stop and think about because, of course, uh, helium left to itself would sink to the surface, but helium goes up because its density is lower than the surrounding air. If we got rid of the air, you know, go to the moon and then release a bunch of helium, and the helium all sinks to the surface. It gets pulled down gravitationally. So it's the gravity on the helium, the gravity on the balloon structure, the gravity on any of that cargo, that all has to be supported by that buoyant force. So here's the setup. Uh, and I call these M1 and M2. I said M1 is the helium mass, and M2 is the cargo. That includes the whole balloon structure. And they've told us that the cargo is 180 kilograms. So here's my force diagram. Here are the two gravitational forces. Here is the buoyant force. And uh, the buoyant force has got to be large enough for both of those gravitational forces. Now, I rewrote B as rho VG with the fluid uh, subscripts and set equal to M1G, M2G, and all the Gs cancel. Now, I don't really have a good way to go after the mass of the helium directly, so I rewrote that in terms of density. So, I've, I've got a table in the book, or I can go online, I can look up the density of the helium. And so, uh, what I need to find here is the volume. That's what they want us solving for. And the mass of the helium is going to depend on how large the volume is. So I rewrote that, and that's a standard practice in these problems, is switching back and forth. We can always go from M to rho V, or back to M, uh, as long as you're clear about which sample you're looking at. So that's the mass of the helium, the density of the helium, the volume of the helium. So uh, as far as my fluid densities, so uh, I looked up air at zero degrees and one atmosphere pressure, and uh, in my table that came up at 1.29. It's a little denser. Remember at 20 Celsius, the density was 1.20. So you can see at zero Celsius, air molecules have slowed down, the air has sunk closer to the surface of the Earth, and the air now is denser. Um, the helium density I looked up, also at, I think also at zero, that's a good question. I think I looked it up at zero. Uh, 0.1785. I hope I, hope I got the temperatures consistent on that. Anyway, you can see the helium is much, much lower in density than the air. So what we can do then is take this equation. Now I took out the mass of the helium, replaced it with density times volume, and then did a little algebra to bring volume to the left side by itself. It says the volume of helium needed, the size of the balloon I'm going to need, because as I make the balloon bigger, I'm going to get more and more uh, buoyancy because the buoyancy depends on how much fluid I've uh, displaced. So if I can make the balloon bigger, uh, the mass from the helium is not going up as quickly as the mass of the air that's being replaced. And that margin, that difference between the two, is going to tell me uh, how much buoyancy I'm going to get. So I can take the mass that I need to support. It's only 180 kilograms. That's not much. 
uh, there's at least one person in here, right? Or did they just launch the balloon by itself? So it worked out 162 uh, cubic meters. And I didn't get a radius on that. Why did I not do a diameter? So, you know, get a diameter on that. I'm guessing that's going to be what? It's 5 times 5 times 5 is 125? I don't know. It's got a diameter of 10 or 12 meters, maybe. That seems reasonable, right? Oh, here it is. Next page. Uh, of course. So here's the volume I solved for R. Uh, R, oh, it's only 3.38. Okay, that's less than what I had imagined. Uh, so the diameter then is 3.4, 6.8 meters. Now, I even went back and calculated the mass of the helium. Uh, so again, I was just kind of curious. The mass of the helium, I took its density times the volume, and I got uh, 29 kilograms of helium. And uh, the air that was displaced, I took the density of air, multiplied by the volume. So what happened with this balloon is we displaced 209 kilograms of air, and then in that region, we uh, replaced it with 29 kilograms of helium. So you can see we've got, you know, 180 kilogram margin to work with, and that's the buoyancy that we're getting. All right, so take a look at those buoyant problems. Those are all really important. Make sure you look at those. So now we're going to take a look at uh, this later part of the chapter. This is going to say, so I'm going to say, you know, big items here were pressure of fluids, buoyant calculating buoyant forces, and now um, fluids in motion. So let's take a look at this. So when we have fluid in motion, we can have nice smooth uh, motion like this. It's called laminar. Uh, but we can also have turbulence set up. So you can see they've done some um, cross sections. It looks like an airplane wing or something in that picture, maybe, right? So here's an airplane wing, and they're blowing a bunch of air over it, and they're letting a bunch of dust come out so they can follow the laminar layers and see when turbulence happens. So with fluid in motion, there's kind of two different ways we can keep track of this. We can measure it in mass per time. You know, at what rate is the fluid coming past me? I could measure that in kilograms per second, or I could measure it in cubic meters per second. Now, mass, in some sense, is more reliable because if the material compresses, well, the mass is still meaningful, but if, if the material compresses, then the volume could change, right? So uh, mass is kind of the, the more reliable one here. And the delta M over delta T, can be given as density of the material times the cross-sectional area times its speed. So that's, that's a continuity equation. It says if I have, say, a pipeline, and we're transporting some kind of a fluid, could be a liquid or a gas, then at each location along the pipeline, that formula has to be true. If for some reason, you know, it's a natural gas pipeline, if the density goes up, then I have to take that into account in this formula. If I measure this at two locations and these numbers don't match, it tells me that something is building up somewhere. Um, there's not a smooth flow, there's not a continuity. Somewhere the fluid is, um, is building up. Okay, here's a diagram showing this. So the cross-sectional area, you know, if it's a fluid going down a pipe, there's a certain cross-sectional area, there's a certain velocity it's traveling at, if the pipe narrows, the speed actually has to go up. Now, this is assuming that the pipe is filled. It's not a pipe where some water is running along the bottom of the pipe. It's a pipe where the fluid fills the entire cross-section. And so, in this case, if I've got fluid going at a, a slower speed here, if, if there's not as much area, then everybody's got to go faster in order to get fluid through uh, that region. Okay, and then here's, you know, here's some, some of the details for that. Now, one thing to watch for here is big V's are volume, little V's are velocity. I hope that works. Uh, a little bit of mass is the density times a little bit of volume. And what we've got here is a little bit of volume of fluid here. Uh, correspond, well, it doesn't correspond, but there's a little bit of fluid here farther along. Uh, the dx here is going to be smaller, and the dx here is going to need to be bigger. Right? If these volumes represent a continuity of flow, 
and I'm breaking the fluid up into regions of equal volume slices, then these slices are going to have to be thicker. And when we go through and solve for the velocities, so um, let's see what we got here. dm1 dt uh, is equal to dm2 divided by dt. This is the density area volume formulas. Those have to match. That allows for variations in densities. Now, if it's not compressible, you know, if you have a fluid that's uh, a liquid, like water, then you probably don't have to necessarily keep track of density changes. Uh, if it's water, almost certainly the densities are going to be the same, or, or other, other kind of uh, liquids. The densities would be the same in both directions. And then instead of thinking of mass flow, we can think in terms of volume flow, and that's going to be AV uh, equals AV at, at all locations. So here's an interesting problem uh, that we can take a look at. What about blood flow? So here's a little bit of, of anatomy thrown in here in physiology. So here is the heart. The blood's pumping out through the aorta. And then it, it separates, right? It goes into uh, more and more separate paths. At some point, the blood will pass through what's called a capillary. Now, a capillary... Uh, uh, capillary is a really narrow uh, blood vessel, a blood path, where the red blood cells uh, can easily release oxygen into the surrounding tissue. So you've got to get right in contact with a capillary to have a reliable oxygen supply. Uh, and so here it is, a bunch of capillaries in the heads and the lungs, where the oxygen exchange takes place. Uh, the body organs, this looks like maybe the hepatic um, liver bypass or under the uh, going through the liver, uh, trunk, kidneys, legs. So what they do is they say, okay, we, capillaries are really hard to, to measure, but what they've done is they've gone in and said that um, the aorta uh, in this person is 1.2 centimeters in radius. So that's a pretty good sized uh, artery, right? Uh, a couple cent, two and a half centimeters across. Uh, and the blood there has been measured to be traveling at an average speed of 40 centimeters a second. That's a pretty good blood flow, right? So you got a, a pipe in there that's like two and a half centimeters, an inch in diameter, and uh, it's moving along on average at 40 centimeters a second. Now, a capillary that is measured, you know, they've gone in and looked under a microscope, four times 10 to the minus fourth centimeters, and they're measuring the velocities here. Now, what they're saying here is, well, we can't count all the capillaries. We can't go in and, and dissect um, you know, uh, and, and look for every last capillary. But what we can do is we can count how many there would have to be using a continuity formula. Uh, the dVdt in the aorta is given by cross-sectional area times velocity. And using that number, the aorta works out to be there's 181 cubic centimeters of blood passing through a location in the aorta every second. 181. That's a lot. For a capillary, uh, the area here uh, worked out to be 5 times 10 to the minus 7. The velocity is 5. Uh, that's 10 to the minus 4. The 4 got dropped. Sorry about that. Uh, that has a 4 there. Okay. Ooh, and that's going to have to get added in there also, huh? Okay. Just checking to see which things got dropped. So uh, here is the flow rate for an individual capillary, and that worked out to be 2.5, 10 to the minus 8. Now, what we can do is we can take the flow rate of the aorta, divide it through, now that's a 10 to the minus 8, that got dropped, sorry about that, uh, and divide that, and what it says is that there's estimated to be 7.2 billion capillaries along the path. So that's a lot of capillaries. All right, here is another kind of similar problem. Here is an air duct coming into the room. Um, and here it says that we need to have air moving at 3 meters per second um, so that we can replenish the air in the room every 15 meters. Uh, what's the cross-sectional area that we would need? Okay, how large of a heating duct should we have? So here is the rate, and that's dV volume per time, and that's given by cross-sectional area times V. 
Now, the rate, they said, uh, is going to be 300 uh, cubic meters of air every 15 minutes. So if we go back, this was, we've got 15 minutes is 900 seconds, and uh, we have to replenish 300 cubic meters. So this is the rate at which air needs to be flowing through the room. That works out to be 0.333 cubic meters every second. So A is equal to uh, R over V, according to our equation. And so that gave us a cross-sectional area, 0.111 square meter. Now, if I think of this as a square cross-section, it says that I need a vent that's 33 centimeters by 33 centimeters. So I gotta have a vent with that much cross-sectional area if we want to use this much speed of air. That's a pretty good speed, right? That air is really moving along uh, because I want to replenish the air in the room every 15 minutes. So, you know, now with the air, they're assuming in this problem that the air doesn't become compressed at any point, and that's probably a reasonable approximation. There's nothing here to uh, compress the air to a higher pressure. All right. Uh, if we have fluid moving through these pipes, we can also use energy conservation. So uh, this is referred to as Bernoulli's principle or Bernoulli's equation. What we can do is we can take a section of the fluid here and combine all of the different types of energies and say that, if again, if we have continuity, then when I look at the fluid up here of equal uh, amount, equal mass here with equal mass here, uh, what are we assuming with the... Uh, we're assuming this is a liquid, I think, and so we're ignoring the densities, and or we're saying the densities are uniform. Uh, so this volume would match this volume. Then the amount of energy stored in this volume needs to match the amount of energy stored in that volume. So let's see what kind of energies we might have. Well, if I have fluid going through pipes and the pipes are changing elevation, that's going to be, they left it out on this side, that's going to be gravitational. Let's, let's look at this one right here. This is the equation I really want to look at. So uh, the one that's highlighted. So what they're saying is the fluid at some location is under a certain pressure. It's got a certain amount of kinetic energy, and it's got a certain gravitational potential energy. Those are all the energy types. So each term here is an energy density. It's joules per cubic meter. If you remember, when we first started talking about pressure, we said units for pressure can be written as joules per cubic meter. And when something is at a higher pressure, it's the equivalent of stored energy, because that energy is released when that uh, reverts back to a lower pressure. So something at a higher pressure has energy being stored. And uh, if we take a quick look at those two locations. So here we're going to have a little more gravitational potential energy than we had here. This is narrower, which means V2 is faster than V1. So there's going to be more kinetic energy and more potential energy here. And that says the pressure will have to come down the pressure will not be as large. Now, this might seem wrong, but in order, we've got fluid coming along here, what's it going to take to raise the fluid to a higher elevation, provide it more energy, and then make it go faster? What we have to do is have higher pressure here for that to happen. So the higher pressure region is going to, some of that pressure is going to be used to make the fluid go faster, and to push the fluid up to a higher elevation. And there's the formula we're going to use. So here's an example. Water is circulating in a house. It's a hot water heating system. Here we go. So uh, it says I've got a hot water heating system and I have a pipe where the hot water goes from the basement up to some upper floor and uh, what they want us to be able to solve for here is, what are we solving for? There's a question mark. The flow speed and pressure. Okay, so this is just one straight shot. We're not dividing the pipe up into 
So there is one pipe that goes from the basement all the way up to the upstairs, and it's going to be used for heating. And so what we can do is we can pick those points, A and B, and say at point A, there's a certain pressure in that hot water, <coughs> there is a certain gravitational potential energy, and then a certain speed at which it's traveling. Uh, similarly, when we get to point B, we have to be able to account for all of that energy. So at the top, there will be a different pressure. Uh, there's certainly going to be more gravitational potential energy. And then again, the water is going to be flowing through the system. So this is water continually flowing, right, and releasing heat. So the idea is maybe we have uh, some kind of a, a, an electric heater down here in the basement. It's heating up the water. And then when it goes up, it releases the heat. And then it comes back down and gets reheated. I should have made it a loop. It seems kind of funny coming off from the side here. All right. Um, so here's what they've told us. They said at the, at the basement location, the speed is 0.5 meters per second. Uh, they gave us the uh, radius of the pipe. That enables us to get the cross-sectional area. Now, uh, so uh, again, here is the speed in the basement. Here is, oh, it's the diameter. Oh, I used pi over 4. We're fine. So that, that, that's a diameter, so that's pi over 4 instead of just pi. And then at the bottom, it's at 3 atmospheres. And then the height here, I'm going to say, is 0. So let's say there's, there's no gravitational potential here, and we'll assign all the gravitational potential energy to the top. So when we get to the top, we want to find out how fast will it be moving. Uh, the diameter is given as 2.6. What will the pressure be? And then the height was given. So two unknowns. And then we know everything at point A. We're going to solve for those two unknowns at point B. Uh, the first thing we want to do is use our uh, constant volume flow rate and say the flow rate at point A matches the flow rate at B. And we can set up some ratios. With that, we got a speed at point B of um, 0.769. So it actually is going faster. The pipe got narrower, so the uh, water is going faster. I hope it has enough time to exchange all that heat, because that's why we're sending it upstairs in the first place. Okay, so I rewrote. Now, there's a lot of terms to keep track of, but the pressure at point B, this is Bernoulli's equation, is going to equal the pressure at point A, uh, plus any differences in uh, kinetic energy. And remember, it's going faster, so there's going to be a boost here, plus any differences in potential energy. It's at a higher elevation, so that's also going to require more energy. The density throughout is at 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, because it's water. And the gravitational field, 9.80 newtons per kilogram, because it's Earth. And so here are the kinetic energies at the basement. Here's the kinetic energy at the top. Uh, we had determined that the speed was a little faster at the top. And so I'm going from 125 joules per cubic meter to 297 joules per cubic meter when I get to the second floor. So I'm going to need extra energy for that. That means the pressure... Um, The pressure at point A is going to have to be higher. Okay, and so um, the gravitational potential energies, I can calculate these. Now, we decided to call this one zero. Look at the gravitational potential energy. So getting up to that second floor is requiring a lot more energy than... And the water didn't speed up that much, I guess. So this was a small effect, but the gravitational effect, that's pretty big, 49,000. Now, to calculate, I guess I wrote this equation. Uh, I should have, no, I guess it's right. Uh, so pressure A is here, and pressure at B is going to be reduced because this is the higher speed, that's the lower speed. This is the higher gravitational potential energy, that's the lower one. So the pressure at B will be reduced, and that's because we used some of the pressure, pressure that was available to raise the fluid up to that higher second floor, and to make it go a little faster. So the pressure we're going to need at the bottom, we had a pressure of three atmospheres. Now I converted that into standard units. So I got 304,000 joules per cubic meter, and we're going to have to add, um, we're going to have to subtract off. We're going to lose uh, 49,000 joules 
per cubic meter of pressure and convert that to gravitational potential energy. So some of that pressure goes into making it go faster, some of that pressure goes into raising the elevation, and so by the time we get to the second floor, we've got, you know, 2.5 atmospheres of pressure. That's fine. You know, when I turn on the faucet, 2.5 atmospheres, that's going to be fine. The water's going to come shooting out. So um, I, there should be no complaints from anyone on that um, upper floor. All right, um, let's see. Uh, here's another example using Bernoulli's equation. Uh, here is a container. It's got some water or some other uh, liquid in there. And uh, we've got a small opening. Now, the key here is that the opening here, we've opened it up, is small compared with the cross-section here. So what we can do is say that the water in the container itself really doesn't have much velocity to it. It can be uh, neglected. Now, the only time the water begins to uh, raise its speed appreciably is between here and here. So there is a continuity going on, and so there is water coming in from different directions. It begins to pick up speed, and then it shoots out. We can use Bernoulli's equation for that. What we can do is say at, at location 1, that water is going to have kinetic energy and uh, gravitational potential energy. Now, at the top, we're going to say the velocity is so small, we're going to neglect the kinetic energy and just keep track of um, gravitational potential energy. Um, where is the pressure? Well, you know, if I go back and I look at Bernoulli's equation, if I go back and look at energy conservation, isn't there supposed to be a pressure on both sides? Well, there, there actually is. Uh, it's dropped out because What's the pressure of the water at the top? You go one atmosphere. So there's one atmosphere of pressure here. When it exits and comes out, what's the pressure of the water here? Well, that's also one atmosphere. So since we started at one atmosphere and ended at one atmosphere, those have dropped out of the equation. So this is telling us that we can go in and predict what is the speed of the water coming out. It's called Torricelli's uh, theorem, or Torricelli's equation. Uh, so if, if this container fills up with more and more fluid, it's going to come shooting out at a faster speed, right? So this is you know, kind of fun, kind of interesting to think of. Uh, we can determine um, at what speed uh, the water is going to become shooting out. Um, so, you know, a, 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 a common example that comes up with this is, where should I puncture a hole in the side of the container so that the water shoots out the longest distance. If I do that right at the bottom, the water comes out really fast, but then it hits the ground pretty quickly. Uh, if I do it at the top, uh, it's got plenty of time to go forward, but it's not going forward very fast. So uh, anyway, that's an example of this. So I, I, I wrote this up too. So uh, I introduced point B. So let's say there's point A here. Point B is here, and then point C, and the idea with this was to say that uh, the velocity at A is basically zero, uh, the velocity at B is basically zero, so we can neglect kinetic energies, and then at uh, point A, we're at atmospheric pressure, and then again at point C, we're back at atmospheric pressure. So what I could do is this, I could say the pressure at A plus the potential energy, I left out the kinetic because it's, it's moving so slowly, is equal to the pressure at B. So I introduced an intermediate point. And, you know, for me that helps me to think of more than just, if I think of an intermediate point, I can see how the energy is shifting back and forth. Uh, and then at point C, I have the pressure, and that's one half rho B squared. But notice, since PA and PC are both atmospheric, this will cancel this, and we've ignored uh, the pressure at point B. So uh, what we're doing is taking the, the kinetic energy at C equals the potential energy at A. That reduces down to V is equal to 2GH square root. Now you guys might remember this. When we just dropped an object from a cliff, you remember just dropping objects? Uh, when we dropped them from height H and neglected air resistance, that was the speed they landed at. 
So it's saying that the speed of the water coming out of this container, we're neglecting viscosities and things like that, the speed of the water coming out of that is the same as if we had just taken a sample of water and dropped it. Right, so we take the water, maybe we put it in a water balloon, and just drop it, and the speed that it has uh, reaching elevation C uh, is the same as putting it in the container and routing it so that it comes out through that pipe. Kind of interesting to see that uh, connection. All right, um, so that, that's all the numerical examples. There's a few just conceptual examples we want to wrap things up with. I think we're getting pretty close to the end here. So I will move through these quickly. It is time to wrap things up. This is an airplane wing. And so airplane wings are designed so that there's a longer path over the top. Uh, and that forces the air on top is going to be moving at a higher speed uh, relative to the wing than the uh, lower velocity below. Now, the faster velocity results in lower pressure. So air pressure is used to hold up an airplane. Where is this force of lift coming from? And uh, it's air pressure differences from above and below. Air pressure is, there's a lot of air pressure. If you look back at that number, 101,300 newtons per, per uh, square meter. That's a lot of pressure. Now this is a sailboat example. Um, it's complicated, let's see. Here is the wind coming towards the sailboat. And if you're a good sailor, you can sail into the wind, right? Or so I'm, so I'm told. Uh, so the idea here is you're setting the sails up. Uh, somehow these sails have curved in this direction. That's going to mean that the air goes past this side of the sail faster. That means this side of the sail will have lower pressure. And you can see that the higher pressure here is pushing into that sail and so the force of the wind is off in this direction. So I'm getting a sideways force from the wind. Well, how is the boat then going in this direction? Well, there's a keel down below the boat uh, that sticks into the water, and that creates a force from the water uh, perpendicular to the keel. So along with this sideways wind and this perpendicular effect on the keel, uh, this boat can sail into the wind. Okay, so it's a standard part of sailing, again, or so I'm told. And then here is a curveball. So here's a baseball. Apparently, home plate is on that direction. Um, this is a top view. The ball is curving. So what we're going to end up doing is creating a faster flow of air on this side. That is going to lower the pressure. And so air pressure from the other side, now it's not much of a difference. But the air pressure is a little, going to be a little higher on this side, a little lower here, and the ball curves to, uh, to the left. Uh, viscosity, now the, the textbook takes a look at viscosity. It's something I want you guys to be aware of. We're not going to do any formulas for viscosity, but uh, some fluids flow without much internal friction, and other fluids have a lot of internal uh, friction to them it can be easier or harder to move fluids through a pipe. Uh, surface tension, here's an example with water. Uh, water molecules like other water molecules. So what they tend to do is they tend to cling together uh, and uh, close themselves into uh, spherical shapes, the water drop. right? So that's a really nice picture demonstrating the surface tension. Now here's a nice picture, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you guys have seen this too. So here, you know, we've got an insect standing on the water. The best part of this is to see how the water uh, bows underneath uh, the weight of the insect. So this insect is, is denser. It's not displacing any water at all. There's no buoyant effect from that. But you can see the water is a little reluctant to separate from other water molecules. The water molecules would like to stay in contact with other water molecules. And so pushing down creates almost an elastic effect on the surface of the water. And again, this is due to um, surface, something we call surface tension. The book goes through how some of these things are measured. Uh, finally, here are some pumps. So here is a, what's called a centrifugal pump. Here is, this is like on my washing machine. 
Uh, I've got water coming in. There's a rotor here that spins around, pumps the water uh, out. So it spins around, and uh, the water ends up getting uh, ending up along the outer circumferences and pushed out. Uh, and then here's you know here's a, a nice um, uh, connection with uh, with anatomy and physiology. So um, here is the heart for chambers, uh, different valve systems. Contractions are um, moving the blood through those. Uh, we will save that for uh, your biology classes. All right, that's chapter 13. Um, lots of stuff in there. Make sure that you're going through looking at... Um, where's a good... That's a good slide to stop on. Make sure you're looking at uh, you know, all the homework problems, the examples that we just looked at in the lectures. If you guys have any questions on those, stop by.